Thank you very much. Great. Then let's directly start with the fundamentals. Um, here you can see the outline. As I mentioned earlier, we are having uh, three blocks. Number one is the fundamentals. We will be talking this week about the fundamentals covering essentially three things. Number one is what is requirements engineering and why is it so important? This is what we will be talking now. And um, what are the core activities and principles like separation by abstraction? This is what we will be talking this Thursday before starting next week with the um, engineering topics. We will be introducing general approaches, software process models, what this actually means for requirements engineering. We will be introducing this model that we are using as the backbone and then going top down how to specify um, the elements uh, necessary in the software requirement specifications before then going on future perspectives with the last um, invited guest lectures. Now let's directly start into the fundamentals and let me directly start with some frequently encountered misconceptions and prejudice before we go actually into what requirements engineering is. Um, requirements engineering, I mentioned this uh, uh, already, is um, a discipline that is quite pervaded by a lot of fuzzy notions and fuzzy misunderstandings. And there are many, many misconceptions that you will encounter as well. And I brought two examples of, um, of misconceptions and prejudice, forms of prejudice that I encounter here and there for many, many years already. One of them being, we don't do requirements engineering, we are using Scrum. Now, you might think that um, if you follow a certain reference model like Scrum, uh, and just because it doesn't say anything about requirements engineering, that you are not using uh, requirements engineering or that you are not doing requirements engineering, but in the end, you are uh, still working and handling uh, requirements. Now, you cannot still be, uh, blame the people who are saying things like these uh, because the term requirements engineering is quite old fashioned. Uh, the term requirements engineering has been coined in 1978 um, in the first appearance in an academic journal in the transactions on software engineering. And back then at the times, we were still having these more traditional heavyweight plan driven ways of working in our engineering approaches. Um, we had this you know, upfront specification phase where we specified requirements using mathematical models, and then elaborating an architecture, then starting with the implementation and so on, these classical more waterfall-like um, approaches. And of course, the world has evolved. Scrum is one of the outcomes, but so has requirements engineering. And somehow we academics still stick to this very old fashioned term requirements engineering. But please take away that uh, whenever we say requirements engineering, we include different forms of interpretations uh, among them, uh, of course, also if you follow um, Scrum. Now, the second uh, form of misconception that I frequently encounter and you will uh, as well, was actually one um, that I encountered when I was doing my, my PhD at this company, SDNM. Um, I was doing, back then to start, uh, in, uh, the preparation of, you know, working on a requirements engineering approach. We started by doing a couple of interviews and uh, we went from business unit to business unit and spoke with different, different people. Among them, one architect there uh, who I explained who I am, what we are planning to do and how we would like to uh, revise uh, the whole requirements engineering uh, in this company and then directly stopped me and said to me, ah, no, 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 no. Uh, our customer doesn't pay to talk about problems, but to get solutions. And this was a little bit of a deal breaker at first. But uh, if you think about this, um, also here, you cannot really blame the people. Um, very often when you read through the textbook literature on requirements engineering, you will find um, many approaches that are written in a more, um, how to put it, in a more apodictic way. They say what to do and how to do it, but they don't really explain why you should do it. And uh, very often requirements engineering um, is seen and lived as a means in itself, rather than as what it really is, uh, a means to an end, okay? Everything we do in requirements engineering needs to fulfill a specific purpose. And we'll be talking a lot about the purpose of why we do certain things. Uh, and requirements engineering. Now, three key takeaways I would like you to take from not only today, but also the uh, rest of the course that will accompany us is that requirements engineering can have many different forms and interpretations. Agile is one of them. And in all of them, it is essential for project success. If you don't efficiently handle your requirements, chances are very high that you will be delivering a product that nobody needs. 
Okay. And number three, the challenges and requirements engineering and the challenges you will face in the projects are very, very manifold and are too manifold to be addressed via universal prepackaged uh, solutions such as Scrum. Okay, and this will be something we will be focusing on in this course. So what are the goals for today's lecture? We will be focusing essentially on three things. Number one is the very basic terminology uh, on requirements engineering. So what is requirements engineering? What is it not? Uh, we will be talking about the relevance of requirements engineering and challenges encountered in practice. So why is it so important? And we will then motivate that there is no um, universal approach to requirements engineering and why we will be doing the things in our course the way we do them with this uh, artifact centered uh, reference model. So three topic areas, what is requirements engineering? Why is it important? And how, um, how does it appear in practice? And also in consequence, uh, what is actually the role of a requirements um, engineer? Now, let's directly start with what is requirements engineering? And this is a question I would like to ask you. <laughs> so what do you think? What is requirements engineering about? Hitting the nail. This yeah. is exactly what it's about. Identifying and finding out what the actual problems are. So the key tasks in requirements engineering. Requirements engineering is very much about the definition of elementary uh, properties, um, requirements of a solution. As I said earlier, the solution can be a system, um, um, uh, an embedded reactive system, for example, a software system, a traditional uh, whatever this then is nowadays, a software system, a service, or even a business process or, or a development process and so on. We will be focusing now uh, in this course on software intensive uh, systems. And the key tasks include identifying um, requirement sources, identifying the requirements, and agreeing on a specified set of requirements, describing them as clearly as possible, um, maybe not implementing and managing, but supporting that the correct requirements are uh, implemented. So a lot of what we do in requirements engineering is about finding a consensus, okay, about what is really uh, needed. There are many, many terms that are very much related to requirements engineering and which terms you find very much depends also on the surrounding software process. So for example, Scrum is one of them. Um, here you can see just a list, uh, an endless list. This is much, much longer than what you can see here with many different terms that all in one form or the other relate to requirements engineering, one of them being, for example, the business analysis phase. This is what you can uh, find in the business analysis body of knowledge, a thick book that covers more from, that comes more from business information systems development. Others are systems analysis. System analysis is what you find typically in systems engineering. Um, other words are the specification phase. Specification phase, I'm not sure if this is still being used, but when I was younger, this is exactly the tame that, uh, term that has been used uh, with these traditional upfront specifications where you use really mathematically oriented models to specify uh, requirements. Um, and the avionics sector, this is to some extent still, um, still being used. Now, please don't get irritated if you see other terms in practice, but take away, um, whenever you work with requirements, whenever you work, for example, with user stories in Scrum, um, this is what we mean by requirements engineer. You have to engineer requirements in one form or the other. Now, but what is a requirement? So um, what you can see here is a rather simple definition. We would like to start with a simple definition. We, we will be refining this definition in the next lecture when we will talk about different categories of requirements like functional or non-functional requirement and what it actually is. Now, requirement is a need or constraint imposed by a stakeholder. So from the perspective of a stakeholder, and it's a capability, a property that a system shall have. So, um, and then, of course, it's a documented representation of both need, capability, or property. What we mean by that is that uh, a requirement can be something very high level, a high level need. For example, um, I need to change my IT landscape or I need to change my specific software because it doesn't comply with, uh, I don't know, with GDPR. And uh, from that, I can infer specific detailed requirements uh, that are more dedicated for example, to how the system shall store the data, how the system shall process the data, okay? So uh, a need by a stakeholder and a property that a software system shall have. Now let's talk about requirements engineering. So what is requirements engineering? 
Um, the definition we're using in this course is that requirements engineering is the systematic, iterative and disciplined approach to develop an explicit requirements and system specification that all stakeholders agree upon. Now, there are a couple of things in this definition that are worth mentioning. Number one is that uh, last part, which is that all stakers agree, stakeholders agree upon. As I said earlier, requirements engineering is a lot about finding consensus, about uh, resolving conflicts, and uh, putting everyone in this system development project on track. Okay, and the other thing that you find there is the term systematic and disciplined, which uh, what we mean by that is that requirements engineering should be something at least that is uh, formulated uh, in an explicit manner, that we do requirements engineering explicitly by having at least one specific approach in mind. Now, as indicated earlier also, um, there is no one way of doing requirements engineering. There are multiple ways of doing requirements engineering. How exactly you do this very much depends on many, many factors. We will be talking about these factors uh, at the end of today's lecture. But uh, regardless of how you do this, there's one, no, there are actually two common uh, denominators. One of the common denominator are the tasks that you do in requirements engineering, which is um, the one you see at the bottom of the slide. So the tasks you do in requirements engineering are always the same. Number one, you have to elicit requirements. So you have to identify requirement sources. You have to identify uh, the relevant requirements in a project. Number two, you have to analyze them. You have to understand the requirements. You have to achieve consensus uh, on the requirements. Typically, to understand requirements, to an analyze the requirements, you use, for example, modeling techniques. You can use uh, prototyping techniques, things like this. Uh, number three, you have to, of course, specify the requirements in one form or the other, which means that you have to structure potentially large amounts of requirements. You have to model them. You have to document them in one form uh, or the other. And last but not least, uh, validation and verification. Validation essentially means, uh, are we building the correct system? Validation, uh, verification means, are we building the system correctly? Uh, typically addressed by, by testing against um, software requirements. Now, one uh, small thought on the notion of elicitation. Um, one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves, especially in requirements engineering, is that requirements are somehow there and they just need to be harvested, you know, like collecting potatoes uh, from a field. And this is, of course, not true. Uh, requirements elicitation and finding the proper requirements is one of the most difficult uh, tasks and should never be underestimated. And this is also the reason why we write here relevant requirements and not all requirements. Finding all requirements is an illusion. Uh, and it's also not really, really important. What is important is to find the most critical requirements and the most relevant requirements, agreeing on those most relevant requirements and specifying them as detailed as possible. Now, I said that all, yeah. If I, may I add yes, just please. one thing here, because uh, uh, also one thing I always find very interesting about the requirements and elicitation part to keep in mind is um, the, the connotation of thinking, well, a customer, a client comes to a software engineer and just tells them what they want and the engineer just builds it. Uh, it's not always the case that the customer really knows what he wants. And this is also a very difficult part of requirements and dissertation, um, helping the customer to understand what he really wants. And maybe some of these requirements, some of these notions are completely wrong or not doable. So this is a uh, a very important uh, stake to keep in mind. And this is one of the dimensions that add complexity to requirements elicitation. As Daniel said, it's not just uh, harvesting exactly. requirements. It's very exactly. difficult to get this. Uh, and finding out uh, how much requirements cost, uh, if it's really worth having them separating wish from actually really needs. This is a very good point. We will be talking actually about this also on Thursday uh, when separating uh, requirements from uh, far too expensive wishes. Um, so, exactly. I meant uh, earlier that uh, there are many different approaches of, of, of doing requirements engineering uh, and they share two things. Number one is the list of the basic tasks in requirements engineering. And the other thing is uh, what we call separation of concerns. So, in requirements engineering, we focus on what we call the problem space. And in contrast, in solution design, when it's about implementation, we focus on um, one thing we call solution space. What we mean by that is that in the problem space, so when talking about requirements, we focus essentially on two things, on two questions, and on only those two questions, which is 
why is something necessary and what exactly is necessary. So why do we need something? Why do we need a change um, of a, uh, um, an existing system? Uh, what are the goals? Uh, what are the regulations that demand for requirements? And what are the requirements? So what should the system look like? In the solution space, in design, um, we address the question, how will the solution be realized? So how should the architecture look like? Um, what, um, what functions will the system offer in order to realize the requirements? So separating problem space from solution space is essential in requirements engineering. And we will be talking about this separation on this Thursday uh, much, much more with some selected examples. Now, another term next to requirements engineering is the term on requirements management. So when engineering means that we uh, elicit requirements and engineer a requirement specification, management means obviously uh, managing and using requirements along the whole system lifecycle. This includes things like archiving requirements, versioning requirements, uh, baselining requirements or packaging them in different releases if I work on different releases, um, modifying requirements uh, and accommodating um, change management, for example. Requirements will always change, especially in long living systems and long ongoing uh, development projects. Now, um, we will be having a dedicated lecture only on requirements management towards the end. So how to manage requirements and how to uh, achieve things like trade Stability and what we mean by that. But for now, take away uh, the term along the whole system lifecycle, not requirements lifecycle, but system lifecycle, because this gives over already an indicator to one thing that is that requirements engineering never really ends. As long as you are, uh, of course, we will be having an increased effort at the beginning of a project, we'll be focusing more on understanding their requirements, but you will always have to work on requirements to keep them updated. Now, the reason being that requirements engineering and requirements and management both uh, build a key interface to several activities in the whole development life cycle. So I mentioned solution space. So the activities concerned with the solution space is what you can see here on the right side of the figure. So how to build an architecture, uh, for example, in, in systems engineering, how to build a logical component architecture, how to define a, a technical architecture, how to do the implementation, integration, and testing, but also how to do operation and um, software maintenance and evolution. All these things very much rely on requirements engineering, but and on requirements, but there are many, many more uh, management activities uh, coming from the project organization and management, like, um, yeah, well, like product, uh, project management itself. Think of uh, contracting, for example. Typically, requirements find their way also into the, the design of uh, contracts. Another way of looking at this is by looking uh, at the outcome of requirements engineering, namely the requirements or the requirement specification. So requirement specification is used along different activities of the whole software development lifecycle, among them being, of course, uh, of utmost importance, uh, the communication with the stakeholders, the communication with the customer. Requirements are being used as one central means to communicate what they really need but also software design, of course. Uh, software design has to accommodate requirements. They have to fulfill requirements. Project organization management, think of effort estimation. Uh, also quality assurance. If I don't have requirements, I have nothing I can really test my software system against. So um, a last word on this very first introduction into what requirements engineering is. Um, as I mentioned earlier, requirements engineering is part of uh, something larger. Requirements engineering is part of a system development. This can be software systems, um, systems in general, systems of systems, uh, embedded reactive systems, and so on and so forth. Um, as I also mentioned earlier, in this course, we will be focusing on software intensive systems and products. We will also try to keep things um, pragmatic and straightforward, uh, which will be only possible if we focus on one area. And of course, in response also to the whole program, we will be focusing on software intensive systems. Now, do you have any questions on that? And otherwise, I would say, let's talk about the relevance of requirements engineering. So let's talk about the relevance of requirements engineering and related uh, problems. So why is requirements engineering uh, so important? 
Uh, let me start by asking the question, what is requirements engineering? What is requirements engineering uh, not? I'm pretty sure that nobody knows uh, who we are looking at. So um, this person is called Bob Ross. Bob Ross was a, uh, uh, tended to say famous, uh, American painter, um, famous in Germany, but then again, I mean, you know, David Hasselhoff was also famous in Germany, so this doesn't really mean a lot. Um, Bob Ross was a, a, a American painter that had these huge brushes and he was painting these uh, pictures and it was always broadcasted on television late at night. Um, so whenever you suffered from insomnia, you looked at watched just Bob Ross and this had a lot of, you know, um, this had an esoteric touch. And this is exactly what a requirements engineering is uh, often to compare it to, um, to being some, something uh, rather abstract, something rather, rather um, esoteric. Yeah, yeah, you sit there, do the workshops, talk with the customers, and we start coding. And this is, of course, what requirements engineering um, is not about. But if requirements engineering is a true engineering discipline, and if it's not something, you know, uh, fuzzy, high-level, um, uh, abstract, and let's say it again, uh, esoteric, then what is it? What is it about? Why is requirements engineering so important? And what happens if you neglect requirements engineering? And this is a question I would like to ask you. So what do you think? What do you think? Why is requirements engineering so important? And what happens if we don't do proper requirements engineering. Exactly. If we develop the wrong thing, uh, essentially, um, or the right thing and the wrong quality. So uh, requirements engineering um, is essentially the point where we set the course for the whole software development. Okay, we define the key functionality but we also uh, define key quality uh, aspects and quality properties. Uh, we will be talking about quality um, later, but for now, think of it quickly like this. Would you still use Google search if you would have to wait two minutes for every search query? Of course not. So we set the course of actions for the quality and the, uh, for the, sorry, functionality which functions should be supported and for the quality, of course. And with that, uh, also for the costs. So how much it will cost because every requirement costs money for being implemented, but also for being maintained. The usefulness related to quality and the complexity. Now, one problem we are having, as I mentioned earlier, is that requirements engineering is um, confronted with quite some misconceptions and prejudice and is often not taken seriously. And one of the consequences is what we know as and what we call solution orientation. Now, solution orientation means that we jump too quickly to conclusions. So if you go too quickly to the solution space, here illustrated um, with a comic, um, because you find it quite often in Agile that we uh, elaborate some, some requirement, and then we start developing the first uh, prototype, that we start uh, delivering the first minimal viable uh, product without really understanding what the key uh, problems is. And this is the, 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 the problem uh, in requirements engineering, jumping too quickly to solutions. So the consequences are clearly that we don't explore the problem space to the extent uh, possible, uh, leading to two things. Number one is that we miss requirements, that we forget requirements that are key, or that we have requirements that nobody really needs, that we think that something is important, but this is not really uh, necessary. And this is what we call gold plating. Now, before you think that gold plating is not really a problem because, you know, there's a feature that nobody needs really hurt, uh, it does. So one car manufacturer that shall not be named um, has been developing over many, many years a high-end uh, class car. So one of the products was uh, more towards the high end. And at some point uh, they noticed that the cost for the operations and, this, and the maintenance of their features that they have implemented is just far over budget. And they were also um, confronted with the problem that the complexity growth was so strong in the system that they needed to handle, um, handle this complexity growth. So what they did at some point was they did a usage data analysis. So they wanted to find out which features are used, how often and how they are used. And they found out that 1000 features 
1,000 features were not used at all. Uh, to my surprise, I didn't even know that a car can have so many features, but um, this is as it is. So gold plating is a real uh, problem. Now, one of the problems with uh, solution orientation is uh, the following. If you uh, introduce an error in requirements engineering, so if requirements are incorrect or missing, but if you spot it during requirements engineering itself, it's an easy fix. You might have some, some further discussions, uh, uh, sit together with colleagues and fix it. But if you dis uh, uh, discover it later, it can become quite expensive. The rule of thumb is that the later an error that is introduced in requirements engineering, the later the error is detected, the more expensive it is to fix up to the level 10 per stage. What you can see on the right side is a uh, an empirical figure that has been inferred by Bennett and Benberg uh, in a post-mortem analysis. What they did is they analyzed a couple of NASA projects and looked um, how much effort went into fixing requirements, errors, or errors in general. And uh, so, which uh, essentially means that errors introduced in requirements and uh, requirements engineering itself, but also detected in requirements engineering is an easy fix. But the later the errors are detected, the more expensive it becomes to fix them. Now I could, oops, sorry, I could go on and uh, show you the empirical figures, but I think that uh, just one story, one one tangible story tells more than thousand pictures. So let's go on with one uh, uh, example that illustrates exactly this problem, toll collect. So toll collect, uh, I'm not sure if anyone knows uh, that company. Toll collect was a company that has been founded back then in Germany. And the idea was um, to develop a system that allowed collecting automatically the tolls for using the German highway, the Autobahn, for the trucks. So uh, or originally, uh, it was intended to install uh, sensors and, and trucks and have satellites that scan the truck movements. And then there was an automated uh, billing of these trucks for using the autobahn. Now, Toll Collect is uh, one of the favorite examples of every lecturer in any engineering course because the, everything that could go wrong in this development, literally everything that could go wrong, this, this development project went wrong. And this is especially uh, interesting from a perspective of um, project organization and management. Now, uh, but it was actually a couple of years later uh, in a meetup that um, I met one of the uh, architects uh, who then told me a story that I didn't find. I mean, it's public, you know, public news, but I didn't find it. And who told me then the story what happened, and which is a little bit of a eye opener, at least from the perspective of requirements engineering. Now, Toll Collect was continuously in news, uh, and it was continuously over budget and 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 over time, and they changed it. So at some point they said, okay. It's, Satellites is not possible, so let's change it to sensors that we install um, in uh, on the bridges uh, that go over the highway, so that we have a direct measurement whenever a truck passes by, it measures it, and then you have to pay a fee, and so on and so forth. Now, um, the the management board of Toll Collect has been also frequently changed then because they never met any deadline, and at the very end they got imposed one fixed deadline: either deliver or let it be. And what Toy Collect then did with a new with a new team also, they defined uh, time boxing. Now, time boxing means that you define one deadline, and you deliver a product at all costs towards that deadline. Uh, if you have to remove certain features, if you cannot be, uh, deliver to the quality that you intended, then deliver it to a slightly worse quality, to a degraded quality, but deliver. So, and uh, of course they were reaching this deadline and of course they were still over time. So they did uh, decide for one thing that is known in requirements engineering, which is feature stripping, which means that you start then removing features that you have originally planned for this release and put them uh, into the next release. Now, one thing that has uh, unfortunately happened is that one of these requirements, which you could not really see directly from the requirements themselves, was uh, responsible or was facilitating um, a wireless uh, interface that is important for patching the system. So they rolled out that system, it finally went live, it finally went to production, and then after a couple of months when they were ready, ready to, to, to update the system, they just figured out that they could not really patch the system wirelessly. So they had to call in thousands and thousands of trucks back to the garage, take the sensor manually and update it manually with a cable. Now, 
this is just one uh, of the story. And please don't think that um, it's only that one incident that has to do with incorrect requirements engineering. Uh, and of course, it's, it's also not uh, not only Germany that is in the news. The news is in fact full of stories that have in one form or the other to do with insufficient uh, requirements engineering. Now in 2018 alone, and only if considering publicly reported failures, so software failures that made it into the news, we had considering only 606, that is not a lot, uh, we had um, an impact of software failures impacting nearly half the world population. So chances are very high that everyone sitting in this course has been affected in one way or the other by a software failure. For me, it was when I've been stuck in uh, Toronto airport. Um, um, when I, you know, everything is fully automatized. Um, everything is just driven by one large software system or actually system of systems. And in my case, you check in, um, <laughs> Oh man, you check in, you use a passport and you go, you know, you do everything with your passport. Now, one of the problem is I have a Spanish surname, which means I have two surnames, Mendes Fernandez. And in my passport, it has two names, name one, name two. And um, what the airlines do, in this case, Air Canada, what the airlines do is they concatenate the names. I'm not sure, look at your boarding ticket whenever you fly and you see how these names are squeezed together. And this is what they also do with the surnames. And this was clearly a requirements engineering error because what happened is that they concatenated my surname and it was not identical anymore with the passport and I could not check in. And this was a software failure. And this is the problem because nowadays we rely completely for our own private life, but also for our professional lives on software systems. And if these don't work, they impact our lives. In most of the cases that we have a software failure, it has to do with requirements engineering. Now let's keep playing a little bit, at least with some numbers to render a little bit more the importance of requirements engineering. Now, one third, one third of all the errors that happen in engineering have to do with requirements engineering. Now, one third of all the errors have their origin in requirements engineering. So requirements engineering is difficult. And one third of the errors that happen in requirements engineering lead to project failure. So requirements engineering is not only difficult, it's also critical. Or as Nancy Levison has put it, much, much better than I would ever be able to do in this article I can really recommend is that the serious problems that have happened with software have to do with requirements and not coding errors. Now, um, all these stories you can find are a little bit more abstract. Um, if you want to know more on requirements, what can go wrong, I can highly recommend you the so-called Naming the Pain in Requirements Engineering Initiative. Now, I won't be talking too much about NAPIA, short NAPIA, uh, because we'll be using this in the lab session, but let me at least briefly introduce you into what this is. Now, um, NAPIA was an initiative I have co-founded together with a colleague from Stuttgart University, Stefan Wagner, uh, 10 years ago. We have our 10th anniversary now. Uh, and it's a worldwide investigation of which practices companies apply in requirements engineering and which problems they experience in their requirements engineering. Now, all the insights um, from the data we gather in NAPIA uh, are openly available through an interactive data visualization, which you can find on the website, napaya.org. But more on this, um, as I said, on the lab. But so far, uh, what are general findings uh, from NAPIA? Most of the companies we survey, and it's a couple of thousand meanwhile, uh, don't have a dedicated what we call requirements engineering governance. That means that they don't have a central uh, role that is responsible for defining requirements engineering processes. And there are two consequences to that. Number one is that they don't have a re reference model for requirements engineering. Uh, and if they have one, so one software process model that says how to do requirements engineering, it doesn't say a lot. There are not clear roles or responsibilities. So what you should do and how you should do it. There are no templates, no definitions on how to specify requirements engineering. So um, in, an, in essence, uh, the, the way of doing requirements engineering and projects is left to the expertise of the project participants. Now the consequences uh, become apparent in the projects. So what you can see here are the top 21 problems that we encounter in software projects that have to do with 
requirements engineering. And this is a purely frequentist view. So you, the more we look to the left, the rarely these more rare these problems occur, the more we look to the right, uh, the more frequently they occur. So I won't go through the whole list in detail, but we can find uh, problems like uh, insufficient support by the project lead or terminological problems, um, unmeasurable non-functional requirements of so non-functional requirements that are not really testable, that are very ambiguously stated, gold plating, which we discussed right now. And then moving to the right, things like time boxing, moving targets, so changing requirements, changing goals, but then of course also incomplete and hidden requirements. Now next to this purely frequentist view, what you can see is a color coding. Blue amounts to those problems that, um, that have occurred, that have impacted the whole uh, project quality, but where they still could deliver um, a final product. Um, they could still go live. Now red amounts to those problems that uh, are meant to be the primary uh, source for a failed project, where no project could be delivered um, at all which means that we have some problems that are a problem, but in the majority of the cases, people know how to deal with those problems. For example, uh, time boxing, or for example, um, I don't know, uh, incomplete requirements. And we have other problems that really rarely happen, but if they happen, chances are very high that the project will fail, like the one on the very left, uh, insufficient support by the project lead. Now, one of the interesting observations we have made is you might argue that, okay, uh, if incomplete requirements is really a problem or moving targets is really a problem, then let's use Agile. Let's use Scrum, just to give you one example, because moving targets or incomplete requirements is specifically in scope of these um, 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 uh, uh, approaches, software approaches. So one insight that we had is that the picture changes a little bit, but not really much. The same problems are still in the top five problems, regardless of your chosen process model, regardless of whether you do it agile or not. And this is a very interesting key insight that we will be looking at more during the uh, lab. Now, one key takeaway from the whole initiative is that the problems in requirements engineering are far too manifold to be addressed via prepackaged and universal solutions such as Agile. Now, what you can see here is something we call alluvial diagram. It shows the flow of all the problems. So it shows what problems we are having, oh, where's my curl here, what problems we are having um, and what the causes are, but also what the effects are going far beyond uh, project failure or success. Now, uh, it's not intended to be readable, but take away that whenever we talk about, for example, agile methods or agile requirements engineering, we tend to talk about solving specific problems, but these problems are only symptoms. So what we need to talk uh, about is the causes, the context factors, everything that leads to those problems. Uh, once we see a problem, it's too late. And this is far, far more uh, than we can address via a simple um, solution. Or in other words, requirements engineering is something highly specific to a context. One thing that might work very well in one project situation, for example, agile requirements engineering, one thing that might work very well uh, at a company, for example, specifying requirements with user stories or specifying them with use case models might be completely alien to the needs and the culture of the next company. And this is what we will be looking at now at the very last part of today's lecture. So what is the role of requirements engineering? What is the form of appearance in practice and what are requirements engineering uh, roles? So as I said earlier, um, how requirements engineering do is done in practice depends on many, many factors. And all those factors together is what we tend to call company culture. And we can distinguish at least four layers that uh, shape uh, this kind of uh, culture, the organizational culture. One of them being uh, what we call the company-wide reference processes or software process models. So these are descriptions of um, um, processes or development methodologies that we can use at a company level. So it can be something very, very big. For example, the V model XT for German public systems or SAFE if you work more um, in, in agile uh, environments that have very large distributed uh, environments. So this picture is already very manifold and these projects, uh, these, sorry, uh, reference processes tend to be very abstract and they need to be tailored. And when we 
tailored means uh, adopted to specific domains, which is the um, second layer. So uh, another layer uh, is the domain specific adoption. So uh, there's a big difference in working, for example, in smart infrastructures or in the um, avionics sector where you develop embedded systems or for financial systems where you, uh, financial services where you work with uh, business information systems. And another layer that increases just the complexity even further are the quality needs. Uh, there's a big difference if you work, for example, in the automotive sector where you need to develop safety critical software systems with sa high safety standards standards that need to be uh, considered during the requirements engineering or usability standards, uh, for example, for the healthcare system. A system that is not usable is never safe. Or security standards, for example, for financial services. And last but not least, and this is actually the most important layer, is the project specific needs and also personal preferences. Uh, you might think that you have found one specific approach of doing requirements engineering uh, and one very precise mathematical notation and then you are confronted with stakeholders that cannot really read them and they they just want to read some plain text some descriptions or some pictures that you draw with your hand so all this renders the way we do requirements engineering now coming from germany uh, uh, we like to compare it in a little bit more simplified manner in this case we like to compare it with beer now, hear me out because very much like beer it is always a matter of taste. Very much like beer, it is always a matter of culture that renders the way we do it and the way we perceive it, requirements engineering. But also very much like beer, at least when considering the German purity law, it's also a matter of having some ground rules. There are some ground rules that you need to respect. There is some uh, hygienic uh, measurements that you need to expect. There is some core principles that you need to observe. But at this uh, same time, of course, there are many, many different forms and interpretations of doing, uh, of producing beer uh, and uh, of doing um, requirements engineering. Now, what you can see here is, um, as I said, requirements engineering has many different forms and interpretations. We have here selected four uh, different ways of doing requirements engineering. Uh, one way, uh, what we call traditional requirements engineering. Um, what we mean by that is that we do a requirements engineering phase that doesn't have to be waterfall. It can be an iterative phase, but we do a requirements engineering with the purpose of creating a requirements specification. So a document in one form or the other can be electronic, a document that contains uh, the requirements towards a software system and all more surrounding uh, information. And this is something that I we typically find in um, customer supplier situations where we have clear contracts, where we have clear process interfaces. Another version of doing requirements engineering is of course the agile requirements engineering, where I have typically not these holistic requirement specifications, but product backlogs, user stories that I write on post-its, I put on the wall and I have in my office. Um, this is something we do uh, typically in what we call in-house software development projects. Um, projects where I can be on site uh, with a direct contact to the customer and direct contact um, with the stakeholders to have frequent discussions and interactions. Another way of doing it is change-based requirements engineering. This is typically found in long-lived systems where um, instead of specifying my requirements document, I specify issues, tickets, I formulate change requests, things like these. And finally, of course, and there's much, much more to it, but finally, of course, uh, code-driven requirements engineering, something that I typically find in open source uh, software development projects, but I don't have these rich, rich specifications, but rather things like man pages, mailing lists, also issue trackers, of course, code comments, and so on and so forth. Now, in this course, we will be focusing on the upper one, on this more traditional view on doing requirements engineering, but we will also accommodate uh, different um, uh, principles like agile, okay? But we'll be focusing on how do we specify requirements and what is the outcome of uh, requirements engineering, in this case, our software requirements specification. Now, a last point I would like to make is that depending on the way you do requirements engineering, there's of course also a shift in the role of the requirements engineer. So typically, okay, you find a requirements engineer, typically you have a role like this, but um, depending on the context, this role might shift to the one of a business analyst or a product owner, sometimes even to developers or data scientists or even uh, project managers. I'm not saying this is a good thing, but I'm saying that this is how it is out there and practice. Regardless how the role 
uh, is defined, the responsibilities should always be the same. Engineer requirements, so elicit them, analyze them, document them, validate them and manage them. And then of course, uh, accommodate the management perspective. So support the planning of a project, support the estimations uh, of the project, control the requirements, engineering process, and so on and so forth. Now, as for the characteristics, only one small remark. Uh, very often we tend to think that uh, the, the primary uh, key skill uh, of a requirements engineer would be uh, technical knowledge or domain knowledge, and it's not really uh, either of both. The primary skill of a requirements engineer is communication, empathy, and mediation. This is what it is about. Finding out requirements, mediating between the stakeholders, and building the bridge between customer needs and systems engineering. Okay, good. With this one, I would like to conclude today's session. So um, take away today, there are many, many different ways of doing requirements engineering. Um, all these processes are very, very abstract, um, of course, but they can be, uh, become very, very complex and complicated. How exactly we will look into in the next uh, sessions. Um, what we will, do, will be doing in this course, we will be abstracting from these complex uh, ways of doing requirements in engineering and instead concentrate on the least common denominator, which is the artifacts. So what is the outcome of requirements engineering? Um, what needs to be created and why? How do these things relate to each other? And this will be used as the backbone uh, of this course. And um, it will be also used, um, hopefully, in your project which we will then be doing and discussing together. So this is it for today. I thank you very much for your attention and it's still time for questions and discussions. Do you have any questions? Absolutely. Um, so we tend to think, we tend to think, is a very good question. Uh, we tend to think that, for example, uh, incomplete requirements uh, always leads, leads to a, a failed project. But very often, incomplete requirements leads, for example, to increased effort uh, during testing, acceptance testing. So uh, testing is a course that you will be uh, having, I think, next learning period. But for now, take away that in acceptance testing, a test requirements. And um, the world is, of course, not black and white. So even if I miss some requirements, uh, it doesn't mean that the project is uh, completely failed, but I need more effort because I need to figure out in retro perspective what the requirements were. This is what they do typically with reverse engineering. Another thing is inconsistent requirements. If I have con uh, requirements that are contradictory, I uh, have uh, an increased effort during change management. Um, I have maybe some, some liability issues. Um, Non-measurable requirements. I have one example, I think it's for next week, I don't know, I have, I have to figure it out again, um, of non-functional requirements that are very vague and very abstract, that are not really measurable, and where people, different people have different expectations when being confronted with the actual software system. Um, for example, we had one example at SDNM uh, where the um, customer always wanted um, an availability of 99.9%. .9%, and it was an online shop. But at the very end, and he insisted on having this, um, uh, and this 99.9% .9 of availability, leading back then, it was a redundant Sun cluster to implement that system to keep it running. It was ridiculously expensive to keep this in operation, uh, so far over the budget. Um, and it was for an online shop, a ticket shop, that really is not, you know, where this high availability is not really uh, needed. So it's very, very manifold uh, what the effects are. Um, you can see them in detail when you explore the data in uh, Napaya, where you use this interactive data visualization. We will be using this um, next uh, Monday. Right, Julie? Right. Exactly. This is a very good question. And this is something we will be exploring a little bit in detail uh, in the next lab session. Um, but, of course, if you're already interested, uh, as Daniel has mentioned, the uh, NAPHIRE initiative, which uh, this is a result from, um, has a very neatly programmed uh, website. So if you want to already have a look at it, just visit the website. They have a very um, comprehensive data visualization site where you can already play around and see this diagram in, in more detail where it's actually readable and try to follow what's, what... Um, are the, the relations between causes, problems, and effects. 
Um, so if you'd like to have a look, just follow the website. Otherwise, just wait for Monday and we will um, yeah. do just that. Yes. Um, let me add a small thing to this, uh, speaking more generally. Um, we know, Julian and me both know that right now, um, everything in this surrounds requirements engineering is still a little bit vague. Um, please don't get scared. We, we intentionally take it slow at this beginning because we want to, to increase your awareness for, for the problems we are having out there. So what it is, what it isn't, it takes some time. Um, it's worth it, uh, you know, taking this time. We will very soon be discussing a hands-on uh, way of doing it and giving you very specific detailed examples of how to do this uh, in, in your projects. And then of course, after your studies in, in reality. But um, let's take the time and for you, take the time to explore the NAPIA uh, data, uh, scroll through it. There's an interactive data visualization, as Julia mentioned also. And there you can see what are typical practices that people apply out there. Um, you can filter the data according to different domains and software systems and types of families of systems like avionics and automotive. It's really interesting to see what types of models do they use people. Uh, we still believe that there's a lot of modeling with UML models, things, but most of the requirements are specified in plain text, natural language. But it's also interesting to see what the consequences are, you know, what the, what the effects of these problems are. So go for it. And uh, we can talk about this, uh, of course, in more detail next week. Any more questions? Because otherwise, I would say we meet each other on Thursday at 8.15. Um, next lecture will be a, a little bit shorter. Um, I think it depends on how talkative I am uh, or we are. But then, thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and see you on Thursday.